Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Late Show on the Planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at BetterHelp. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some background and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even a little bit different than ours. Uh, joining me today, we've got, of course, Ray Ora. Hi. We got Jonathan Voico. Hello. We've got the delightful Chris Carr is here. Hey, everybody. Writer, director, producer Robert Meyer Burnett is here. I got a three-body problem, man. It's good. <laughs> and uh, it's a full house today. It is Yay! a full, full house. We've got Ooh. everybody in, uh, except for Ray's not Aww. in this shot. But Look uh, at all he, these full squares. We don't even have to put Euro Pussy in there. That's great. Yeah. No, no Euro Pussy. I can just toggle me and Ray. <laughs> well, I can't even say that without getting canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and being demonetized. All right, guys. It's good to have you all here, and here's how today's show is going to go. We've got a couple of topics that we're going to discuss, and then we're going to move over and start taking your live comments and questions. Now, if you guys have a thought, comment, question, observation that you'd like us to address in the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat, and as long as it's appropriate for us to address, we'll address that in the second part of the show. All right, guys. With that all down, let's get things started with this, shall we? You know, there's been a lot of drama going on with uh, Paramount Studios, but a lot of discussion about how they're having some financial problems, a lot of talk and discussion about whether or not they're going to be sold. We know that there have been a couple of offers made, but now a big offer has been made of $11 billion and not even to buy the whole package of what they got going. This comes from the folks over at Variety who write the following. Apollo Global Management, a major private equity firm, has submitted an $11 billion bid to acquire Paramount Pictures and the Paramount TV Studios Group, according to a published report. The Wall Street Journal, citing an anonymous source, reported that Apollo Global offered $11 billion for Paramount Global's film and TV studio business that would apparently not include, get this, that $11 billion does not include trying to purchase CBS, Paramount Global Cable's networks like BET, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, and MTV, or the streaming business that obviously includes Paramount Plus and Pluto. So that's some pretty major omissions that they're saying is not going to be counted towards this. Now, the funny thing is, too, when I look at what Paramount is doing right now, they've actually got like some pretty cool projects coming up. Like I'm looking down here, just coming this year alone. Like they already had Bob Marley, One Love, which was a pretty good hit for them. That worked out really well for them. They've also got coming out um, If, which, you know, the, the imaginary friend from John Krasinski, that could be really good. Uh, a Quiet Place Day One is coming out in 2024. That could be a good hit for them. They got the Beverly Hills Cop. They got Transformers One. Uh, they've got a Smile sequel. They've got Gladiator 2. They got Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and a film called Better Man. All that just coming out this year. So they got what could amount to a pretty decent 2024. But what I find interesting here, guys, is this whole idea of an $11 billion bid, but not wanting CBS, BET, Comedy Central, Paramount Plus. And by the way, the report also says they'd be picking up a bunch of Paramount's debt as well as acquiring the production studio and, of course, the television studio. Now, I, I read somewhere that the to grand total valuation right now of Paramount Global as a whole is something like $8 billion. So these guys are offering $11 billion for just part of the package. Rob, you're hearing about this. Does this $11 bid make sense? Is this a big enough bid to actually get the shareholders of Paramount to maybe make a move? What stands out to you about this? I don't think it's enough. I, I think really? it, I think it seems to me to be a bid. If they acquire, they're just going to sell off everything. They'll part it out. They'll sell Star Trek to somebody. They'll sell the Godfather to somebody. Maybe they'll take their entire, or, or unless they already have a buyer, like say Netflix, you know, or something, something like that. It just doesn't seem like it's enough money to me. 
because they're getting the entire Paramount legacy of film. I don't know. Do they get the Paramount lot as well? I don't know if that's part of I it. mean, I'm thinking since that's part of Paramount Global and Paramount Studios, mm-hmm. I think the lot yeah. is part of Paramount Studios, so it probably would include the Hollywood lot. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's that's a lot and uh, a lot, a lot for the lot. Uh, <laughs> but I I, I it's just, it's, it seems like, look, Fox, Fox, they didn't get the Fox, Disney didn't get the Fox lot, you know, and they paid $70 billion or something. Mm-hmm. And it seems, I mean, I know Paramount's in a depressed state, but why does this company want Paramount and what are they going to do with it? I think I don't think Sherry Redstone would want a company that's not going to have the best interests of the legacy of the studio mm-hmm. at heart. I just don't think. But but then again, cash is cash. And if I, I said cash, yesterday, I said yesterday when we were talking about this, I thought it would be about 15 billion plus. So yeah. this mm-hmm. does seem low to me as well. Well, remember, they're leaving off the table. Like they're saying the valuation is somewhere around eight billion. They're mm-hmm. offering eleven and they're leaving BET off the table. They're not trying to get CBS. They're yeah. not trying to get Comedy Central. They're not trying to get Paramount Plus. But like Rob, you're pointing out, it's really probably mostly about the library, the IPI library they're getting there. Chris, you're you're hearing this. What are the parts that's standing out to you the most? Honestly, the biggest thing here for me was what all is being sold as I was going through this. And I don't know if Paramount is even sure about what they're willing to part with or what they're doing right now. You know, there's talks about Paramount Plus being bundled and combined with NBC's Peacock. Uh, we had a previous offer from Byron Allen's Allen Media Group for 30, which is a significantly higher number. But we also didn't know whose media partners were, who all these other buyers were, who else was facilitating that money. Um, and it was an unsolicited offer. So I I feel like Paramount is in a position right now where they don't know what to do. They don't know which IP to sell off. They don't know how they should sell it off. And I think their buyers are unsure of it too, because again, we've brought this up before. This is a very tenuous time in the industry. Even though we came back from that strike, we didn't fully come back. Mm. A lot of money was lost. A lot of money was lost and people are being very, very ginger about what they're going to green light. This is the slowest pilot season in decades. Yeah. So few things yeah. have been great lit. So when you're acquiring new media and acquiring debt, you really have to think about what is the most beneficial for you, your studio's IP, what's going to be legacy kind of content that you can really, really mine. I don't think this is the offer they're going to settle on. But then again, I don't know how how truly bad they are right now. They laid off 800 people last month mm. and they've been very, very selective with what they've been talking about in their quarterly or- earnings reports. It just seems like it's a mess over there and I don't know who's going to give them the money they need. And the the whole laying off 800 people kind of suggests they're trying to position themselves to maybe be a more attractive uh, buy. Uh, exactly. If, if you will on that. What do you think is... Like for them right now, again, this was an offer that did not include trying to pick up CBS, BET, Paramount Plus, all that kind of stuff. The other offer that came in that was much higher obviously did include all those packs. Do you think Paramount might be in more of a position now where they're looking to sell off pieces or do you think they're looking at something that would be more attractive to them if it's for the whole package? Like so Rob, like... Do you think they're going for a whole package thing or, or do you think they're looking to sell just sell off individual pieces like the studios? I, I think at this point, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I hark back to our our, our patron saint, Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, <laughs> you know, because it's wreckable, you know, like Blue Star Airlines. Let's buy it and part it out. I mean, the, the problem is that, that the business, nobody cares about the legacy of the studios. Nobody cares about uh the things that we care about. They, they see something as assets that they can make money for, for their shareholders or their investors or whatever. And unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. And now these entertainment companies, as they tried to abandon their core businesses that worked for a century and. Oh, it looked like Rob froze. Oh, there he's back. <clears throat> oh, they, they, they tried to shoehorn a wall street model into these kinds of things. Um, They've, they've completely ruined their core businesses, and now they're desperate for cash. They're hemorrhaging money. Their stock prices are down. So unfortunately, any, any kind of, of, of reverence that anybody had for these studios is out the window. And so if they feel that they can – what's really interesting is like – I hate to bring this two words up, but Star Trek is a bifurcated 
rights. I mean, everything has sort of been brought underneath Paramount Global with CBS and Paramount Studios. But if you sell the studios, do they own the feature film versions of Star Trek, but not the underlying IP for the TV show? Because if you don't buy CBS, that means you don't get like the Twilight Zone. You don't get I Love Lucy. You know, you don't get Bonanza. And and I would think that would be something that would be something that a buyer would want. Who knows? I just don't understand. All right, guys. Well, the question is for you. What do you think about this? An $11 billion bid just for the two television and movie studios, not including other valuable assets like Paramount Plus, CBS, BET, Comedy Central, things like that have been on the table. Do you think they're going to go for it? Do you think they're going to hold out? Do you feel like Rob does that is not valued enough? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, the whole idea of physical media versus digital is one that's been talked about, discussed, bantied about for many, many years now. The reality is physical media is disappearing. And there's two different conversations. Is physical media dying and almost dead? And should it be dying or dead? Those are two very different conversations. Uh, I myself am a digital guy. I, I, I kind of abandoned physical media a long time ago, but there are some very valid reasons why one might want to have physical media. But there's been a new breakthrough. And news of this came out a few days ago that I have to ask the question, could this little breakthrough actually cause a revitalization of physical media and maybe even save physical media? Um, because according to reports, scientists have just developed a disc that can hold 200,000 gigabytes on one disc. Oh, so this comes us from Tom's guide that write the following. We love 4K Blu-rays, but scientists are on the verge of a breakthrough for optical media. A research team from Shanghai just published a research paper on nature that explains how we can use 3D nanoscale storage to store 200 terabytes <laughs> on one disk. This is ludicrous to me. The technology uses a light-sensitive material called I sorry, AIE DDPR and two different optical lasers, one blue laser with a 480 nanometer wavelength and one orange laser with a 592 nanometer wavelength to read the data stored on the disk. Writing data to the disk requires green 515 nanometer lasers as well as 369 nanometer. Now this is where it gets interesting. While traditional storage techniques use two dimensions, the new optical technology uses three dimensions and can have up to 100 layers that could be read that equates to a 4,000-fold increase over the three-layer 100-gigabyte limit Blu-ray discs that we currently have. Put this into perspective. <clears throat> this means you could not only have a couple of episodes on a disc. You could not only have a whole season on a disc. You could literally take one disc and have an entire series. Like you like Star Trek The Next Generation? One disc. Here you go. <laughs> that, that whole thing of having to take up like buy new bookshelves and, and store 55 other discs? No worries. <laughs> one disc. Here you go. You're Rob's going to have to rebuy everything. <laughs> yeah, Rob's going to have to go out and repurchase oh, every, no. every single thing that he's got. But I mean, seriously, every once in a while, a technology comes out that like literally changes the game. This is one of those things that actually changes the whole paradigm. We're talking about one disc that can hold 200 terabytes of information. Like one of, as somebody who ditched physical media, one of the big things to me, well, a couple of the big issues to me that caused me to move away from physical media is storage space. Like it's it's literally taking up space for something that maybe I'll watch once every five to 10 years. <laughs> so storage space, the sheer number of discs and things that you have, things are going to get lost, whether, you know, you forget things that you lend to friends or in a move or you forget where you place certain things, like all that kind of stuff. If you could literally narrow, like narrow that down 
that for every one disc you have, that could replace 40 or 50 or 100 other discs that you have. And you and you literally can take a 700 disc collection and narrow that down to just four or five discs <laughs> that you have. Like that to me, guys, a lot of the drawbacks that I see with physical media, that addresses not all of them. But this could address a lot of those limitations and a lot of those concerns. Now, of course, it means if you break one disc, you just lost 17 That's, movies and, and five yeah. and five and entire TV series. Yeah. You Great. put all your eggs in one basket. Yes, the, the, the drawbacks of putting all your eggs in one basket. But yeah, I mean, this is tantalizing. And, and Rob, I mean, I really got to ask you on this because as somebody who clearly loves his physical media and dare i ask how many individual blu-rays and dvd discs do you think you own he just added one <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i probably have about four thousand. okay <gasps> and so and i'm you're talking about literally being able to reduce that to seven or eight or nine okay, discs. Okay, but that's, okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. That, But that'll never happen because you have to think about the fact that each movie is its own business. Sure. So I, I could see, and also you would need new hardware. The real threat to physical media now is we're kind of living through this renaissance of physical media. But the problem is the players are getting sparser and sparser there's very few choices no one's making like hundred dollar blu-ray players anymore so i like there's these high-end players that are 1500 bucks if i had like an extra 4500 dollars, not that i ever will but i would buy those players and like store them where they store wine you know in a climate controlled environment so i would have players for the rest of my life so when one craps out i'll have another one to just take its place because it's it, it that's the real thing these new discs are going to be great for like computer centers that have massive amounts of data yeah. storage, storage backup. Yeah. Video and, and storage backups and things like that i mean you could literally the entire encyclopedia britannica or whatever but for physical media you know each individual movies is like i said it's its own business they have to sag needs to know how many discs you're going to sell and so it it would it would be uh i think valuable for an entire like how many episodes of the Simpsons could you put on a disc? That would be right. something, but they'll never, you have to have new hardware that could play those discs. Cause they don't, they don't play the same way that our movie discs I mean, play. And look, John, I have, I'm under no illusions, physical media. We probably got five years left. Maybe. I mean, PlayStation five and, and, or an Xbox X extended the life by including disc players in it. They're not going to, they don't even want you to buy games anymore. They want you no, to download. Yeah. Them. Yeah. And to your the point, Rob, the idea of like uh, you could get a two disc box set of the entire Criterion collection, kerplunk. But I mean, like you said, how do you track that then? Then you know the royalties yeah. have to go Speaking out. Of, and... Look, John, just came in. Oh, Four, a tremendously 4K. underrated 4K. film. Mm. Just got it. Tremendously underrated film. In that pile. That's for you, buddy. And back on that pile. So, but I mean, to your point, that like you brought up, like. <laughs> In the last year or two, there have been a couple of discs that came out where, like, I remember there were all these headlines about Oppenheimer, like they ran out of stock. Well, that's because they didn't make anywhere near as many discs as they used to make because they know people don't buy them. And so they max that out. But while we have had a little bit of a, uh, of a renaissance of some discs that became popular, the past year showed that Blu-ray and DVD playing machines hardware continued to drop at an even faster rate so people who are currently physical media people they they bought a few more things in physical media but the players didn't sell so nobody bought that mm -hmm. and that becomes more and more of a problem and as these game consoles which a lot of people you saw i remember you brought up that one survey rob where that that uh, uh, the, a big percentage of people who still watch physical media watch them through their game systems. And yeah. we're seeing a transition. The game systems are, are even like phasing out the physical media. Like to me, I mean, Rob, you're right. They, they still have to sell them as individual discs. But I mean, somebody like me, if I was going to readopt physical, the idea that I could still buy an individual disc 
but not have to keep it. I could buy right. that individual disc, put it into my computer, and immediately transfer it onto my God Master 200 terabyte disc. And I could just keep everything on that. I, I tell you what, guys, for somebody like me who's been an ardent, I don't use physical media anymore guy, that becomes kind of appealing. Chris, I, I don't know how many discs you and Logan have laying around the house, but I mean, is is something like this, like a, a single disc that could literally hold like 4,000 other discs, does that become appealing to you? Do you think it's going to move the needle for anybody else? What do you think? So going into this topic, seeing this email today, I went, oh, I don't want to do this because I'm going to hurt Rob's heart. No, 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 um, it's okay. <laughs> so I, I actually, I moved my discs today because you guys know I'm moving right now and I'm doing the slow crawl. And I have a very, very special, special media, right? Of like Lord of the Rings, the special editions that are in those beautiful box sets and everything. My steel book from Nickelodeon of Avatar, those kinds of things. It's very limited though. I maybe have 30 <laughs> physical pieces of physical media still in that kind of way. The rest of them, I keep in my early aughts CD binder, just in the <laughs> sleeves. You're not the only one. Okay. Is, this, is this 1997? I'm so sorry about it. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, do I have reactions turned on? Oh my gosh. Um, but so I, I have a very limited space and that's how I carry things. I don't know if this would change the, or move the needle for me aside from having a storage unit for, for those other ones that I keep in that binder. I just keep coming back to, yeah, like Rob said, residuals are going to be an issue. How do you track that kind of thing? How do you track these DVD sales or these Blu-ray sales? And then the other thing is, how do you fight instant gratification? And by that, I bring up a John Mulaney bit. Hmm, he watches this movie that's on television when he owns it on DVD. Mm. People just always do that. Oh, you own this. Why are you watching on Netflix? Oh, well, this is easier. Rob's talked, Rob's done habit. that. Rob was talking about that, I think, just a couple of weeks ago. That he, right. he goes, like, this movie came on TV, so I sat and watched it, even though I have five copies of it over on the shelf. Exactly. See, you, I, it, it's hard to fight that instant gratification. Even when it comes to buying physical media, I can get it in two days from Amazon or less. But I can download it right now and have it in my virtual library this instant. Well, I think the real... The real fear that I have when it comes to things like physical media is because everything is analytics driven, you're going to end up with the top 5% of what people watch. And then the rest of the 95% yeah. yep. of cinema history is going to fall by the way. So I'll give you an example. A company called Vinegar Syndrome released, despite the name, uh, a, a, movie a, called, name. a movie called Sex Mission. Ooh. And Sex Mission is not, it's, it's a science fiction film. Oh, it's a science fiction. It's not about that, but but I saw this movie at a film festival in 1984, and I had was never able to see it again. There, it's a Polish, it's an Eastern Bloc science fiction film, and they recently released it, and I picked it up, and there was no possible way that I would ever get to see this movie again, this science fiction film again, and about these guys that wake up in the future, and I wanted to see it, and no one's ever going to put it on a streaming service, and if they did put it on a streaming service, very few people would watch it in the first place because they don't even know what it is, and it's Polish, and it's from the 80s, and so the problem is that movie will eventually be gone from human consciousness, and that's why I collect physical media is because I have sex mission, I own it, I might only watch it one more time before I pass off this mortal coil. But one I last mission. On my shelf. One, one last, last mission. mission. One I last do. Last I love the idea of Rob having a cellar that he goes into and he like blows the dust off of a PS5 and it's like, ah, a 2024 vintage. Mm. And he looks in this disc in there and it's going to be magical. It's going to be a lovely I, thing for you. I'm curious because Jonathan, there it is. Jonathan, <laughs> you're, you're the only one here who's got you know, who's got kids. I, I, and I, 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 this is not a facetious question. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm really, All really right. curious. When is the last time you remember one of your kids buying a DVD or a Blu-ray? Uh, Never. I mean, <laughs> Isabel would be the only one that does that because she's got, she's kind of like Rob. She loves physical media and she loves collecting. So she'll buy vinyl and she kind of gets that from me. So, but that is not the rule. That's the exception. The other two never, literally never. Literally yeah. never. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. And I'm, listen, I'm the hardcore, I ditched physical media ages ago, but I got to say to me, a disc that could hold 200 terabytes. But see, this is. That becomes uh, tempting to me. That's tempting. 
at this point though with this technology if it, it develops where it's on a market even on a corporate level there's no excuse for uh for studios not to be backing up i, I don't want to hear any more about these movies that are rotting their 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 you know the cellulose is rotting somewhere in the, the salt caves i don't, yeah. I don't yeah. yeah everything needs to be backed up from now on yeah. by these corporations but right, the guys. problem is they don't want to spend the money yeah well yeah guys the question is for you what do you think about this? If you're like me, and there are many people like me who kind of ditched on physical media, but does the concept of having a piece of physical media that can hold infinitely more than what the old stuff, would that move the needle for you at all? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? One of the greatest television shows to come on air in the last decade or more has been House of the Dragon. It, it surprised a lot of people, not just those who maybe were kind of lukewarm Game of Thrones fans, but even like hardcore Game of Thrones fans and even Game of Thrones fans that kind of fell off the show in the last season or two who were very skeptical about House of the Dragon. All of a sudden, House of the Dragon came back in. They checked it out and was like, oh, my God, this show is really freaking awesome. And it's just been incredible. And we've been waiting anxiously for House of the Dragon to return. It's coming back in less than three months, guys. Less than three months and House of the Dragon returns. And today they dropped not one, but two new trailers called the Black Trailer and the Green Trailer. And the folks over at Variety wrote this. They said, House of the Dragon is asking viewers to pick a side. In season two, Rhaenyra's black faction or Alicent's green team uh, is who we're being asked to make decisions between. And it says, HBO dropped two unique trailers Thursday for season two, which premieres on June 16th. One trailer focuses on Rhaenyra, Prince Daemon, and their forces on Dragonstone the green and other is centered on King's landing team of Allison. Sorry. They're the black and team. The, the green team is of course landing team of team Allison, her father, Otto and her children, King, King Aegon and Prince Aemond taking place 200 years before the events of game of Thrones season two of house of the dragon will officially mark the start of the dance of the dragons, the Targaryen civil war. I always thought, bet on black. Always, always bet on black. Ah, uh, the, the wisdom of Wesley Snipes shall never hey, disappear. <laughs> I, I'll i tell you what. You guys know I, I love House of the Dragon. I've been dying for this show to return. I think the idea of releasing two trailers is absolutely and utterly brilliant. Releasing two trailers is such a fantastic idea and really calling on people to pick a side. You know, which side are you going to be on? And I think all of us on this esteemed panel today with one voice agree that we are all team green, right? <clears throat> you would be team green. I'm oh just my saying, God. Like, oh. like Ray agrees, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, full of rats. That's, that, that's right. where there was full I, of rats. I kid you I, not. I, can I mention something, John? You forgot one demographic in your intro right there. There's also people who never watched Game of Thrones, like me, who actually True. really yeah. liked house of the dragon and it's just on board now you know and that, so. that it's it just stands on its own even without the original house of the dragon um i mean we we're we we're sitting around the office today i mean i'm in here and ray's out there and i hear ray watching the trailers and he's watching the green trailer first and all i hear is all i hear him is mumbling to himself rats they're all rats they're all rats <laughs> um to be honest, I am I, like facetiousness aside i am really more of a team black guy i i am i am more of a team black guy um, I love both of these trailers, you know, showing them from both points of view. I mean, look, at, we, we know the king died wishing his daughter to be on the throne, but Allison legitimately thought that the king was saying he wanted her son to be on the throne. So, so you got this really kind of neat dichotomy. The whole way they set it up about these, not just two um, competitors against each other, but these two people who were truly the best of friends oh, yeah. now pitted against each other. I, I, I love this show dearly. I love both trailers, but I'll tell you what, for me, the moment of the trailers is, uh, Matt Damon, not Matt Damon, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> not Matt, Damon. Like, Matt, Smith. <laughs> Matt Smith playing Damon. 
uh, on his dragon and just going, you have two choices. Renounce <laughs> the false king and bend a knee to Rhaenerys or watch your house burn. I mean, it was just such a Damon thing to say and the way he said it. So I got to ask Rayford because I, I mean, there's nobody who is more firmly one side over the other here <laughs> than Ray. So Ray, what did you think of the trailers? Oh, okay. From what I know in Game of Thrones, here's what worries me. Um, they're they're not afraid to kill people, fan favorites. Yeah, I haven't read the books. I don't know what's going to happen. But if you take Damon away, you, I'm done. This, it's going to be a sad <laughs> house at the. It's the sad house. It's going to be a sad campy house. There's going to be an empty chair. There's going to be no be meat. Chair. There's going to be no meat on the grill. There's going to be <laughs> nothing. I'm leaving. You better stretch out his life for like at least oh. two seasons. Two or three it's just going to be Ray singing Les Mis. Yeah. All my friends are dead. Uh, and that's all I care about. All I care about. He seems to be the only person that I I, I kind of relate with as in like all the back talking and like talking behind each other's back. He seems to be the only one that's just like, you guys are dumb. You know, that's why I really like him. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what's going to go on. I've been waiting for this. I mean, it seemed like yesterday uh, uh, season one ended and then they were they announced, oh, it's going to take us a long time to get to season two, but now we got, just got the trailers, so we're 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 getting the ball rolling. I'm I'm on this journey. Let's do it. I can't wait. Empty chairs and empty tables. Anyway, that's Chris, that's what it's gonna be. That's it's totally odd. He's going to be lamenting with a drink in his hand. Chris, you saw the trailer. Well, first of all, I've never asked. Team green or team black, and and what did you think about the trailers? I tend to gravitate towards team black. Even though those are <laughs> illegitimate children. Like, oh, yeah. Allison, you are not wrong. You are correct, ma'am. Mm. But I tend to gravitate toward to, uh, to them, which is always weird. Uh, the thing with Game of Thrones is like, I shouldn't root for incest. I shouldn't. <laughs> and yet here we are. The thing that I love about both of these trailers, though, I mean. It was a lovely night on a beach and <laughs> the stars were it was, out. It was romantic as heck. You know, um, know. what I love about these trailers, though, is that we've talked about this so much with this show. It is so cinematic. It is so well done where it feels I mean, it feels very HBO, but it feels movie like it feels like it's on this whole other level, especially I mean, not to throw shade at, at Marvel or DC. But when I watch some of these things and sure, a lot of these dragons were seen at night. We're not seeing them with a lot of detail, but it feels so epic and so well done. Absolutely. So ultimately, the winner is us who gets to watch it. But but Ray, the first rule, rule of Game of Thrones is you cannot say who you love because they will die. They will be killed so quickly. I know, I know, I know, I know. They'll I know. be taken from you. But I'm with you. The dragons look excellent. Like there's some shots where they're, they're the lights even on them. They're not hiding the CGI at all. It all looked great to me. There wasn't one shot where I was like, that's kind of questionable. I so. also really hate Allison's children. I just hate them. Oh, oh they're, they're awful. the worst. They're horrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible children. But it, Chris, you raise a really good point, which is when you look at the incest. <laughs> well, the incest. Let's mm -hmm. talk about incest. No, but when you talk about like a show like Game of Thrones, a show like Last of Us, a show like Shogun. Like, these are shows that are absolutely putting Star Wars and Marvel and DC to shame with yeah. the, the the cinematic quality. Andor might be the one except I'll, I'll put Andor up there with the way it was shot and the yeah, scope of sure. it and the epicness of it. Like, I'll put that one up there with, like, say, House of the Dragon and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, like... These shows are putting these huge, massive franchises and their television offerings to shame. Like, why doesn't Marvel create television? Like, if you're going to put out stuff on Disney Plus for Marvel, okay, if you're going to do that, do it. But why not put the love, attention, energy, and effort into it to make it feel like a true cinematic event like Game of Thrones does, like Shogun does, like, like some of these other shows can? Because I'm telling you, they just deliver. Like these shows just deliver week in, week out without 20 minute episodes. And sorry, I'm going to go on. A, I, I'll, I'll try to restrain myself from going on a whole side tangent here. But I, I just think you make an excellent point. Like, why can these guys do it and do it so well when you got these biggest franchises in the world? 
that can't seem to, to pull that off at the same time. So, I, I mean, there's that. Anyway, Rob, you had a chance to see the two. Are you team black or team green? And, and what did you think of the trailers? Well, John, I'm going to quote John Cutter. You ask yourself, who is John Cutter? John Cutter was played by Wesley Snipes in Passenger 57. <laughs> and he had this he had this philosophy to offer. When you play roulette, <laughs> you always bet on black. Are you? Did you not? Did yeah. Okay. Were you not listening? Were your you not headphones miss my joke muted? The- <laughs> like they just just said that five minutes ago. I guess. Hey, let him have Robin it. Robin zoned out. It. Robin zoned out for. Just thinking about physical say. media. You didn't say John Cutter. <laughs> well, it didn't say John Cutter. Said I Wesley said Snipes said black. always bet on black. Just let oh, him have well. it. Just let yeah, but everybody it. says okay. that. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, but no, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, you know, the thing about, I just love Renaris Targaryen. <laughs> I love the whole that side of the family. Oh yes. So, you know, oh. I and and look, I love redhead, so I should go for Allison. But the problem <laughs> is to me, uh, she she as much as I love her, she's she's kind of dumb. She's a lot. She's allowing herself to be led around by her power mad father, who's mm. clearly you know the the wearing the pants here, and he's he's selfish. And he's using everybody. He was using his daughter the whole time, the whole marriage to Viserys or whatever. I mean, it's 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 all a bunch of BS. She's being manipulated four ways till Sunday. Oh yeah, gotta, Otto. I, Otto ahead. is is kind of if you had to say, like the, one of the brilliant things about Game of Thrones is that you can never point at Game of Thrones and say this one person is the bad guy, no. or or whatever. Right? There's always multiple levels going on at all times. But if if you had to point at one person in House of the Dragon say, who's the villain? It's Otto Hightower. Yes, it is. I mean, I I think, you know, his, his grandchildren are little turds, yes. And they may definitely, Aegon may definitely turn into, or, you know, Aemond may definitely turn into the more prevalent villain. But, like, up until now, like, Otto, he's a manipulative father um, who, oddly enough, and this is why I love the whole Game of Thrones universe, I think Otto legitimately loved the king. I, I think he legitimately loved his king. Mm. I think he legitimately, in in his own twisted way, you know, wants what's good for the kingdom, even though it's very convenient that what he thinks is good for the kingdom is also in his personal best interests. Sure. But but I mean, yeah, for I feel bad for Allison because she loved her friend, but she's she loves her family and wants to honor her house, but she's got an incredibly manipulative father, like Rob is pointing out. I mean, it's just one of the things. It's the fact that they are so good at painting in shades of gray in this universe that makes it so delicious and and so great to 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 watch on a weekend week out basis. Absolutely. I think I think you nailed it. I mean, that's what makes this such great drama is that the shifting sands of allegiances and things change. And and I think that you never know. I mean, if you've read the books, you might know, but but the stories are 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 so compelling for that reason because nothing, everything is gray. I had and, a and, for, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, I mean, just picking something that what I like about it, it's like life. Yeah. Like our real life. It's as like opposed a box of to, chocolates. Oh if you will john cutter too is that john yeah. cutter too that's, okay. that's i had a question I had, I, had, I had a question wesley snipes other great quote always oh, been man. on chocolates i had a question okay so <laughs> this doesn't come out until june right yes. or, yeah june, june 16th that's a lot of time i'm re- i'm really excited should i should i go read this book that they're doing no this is the first time i've ever asked <laughs> no don't read like it no no, no, I wouldn't read it either. No, because it's I, not really a book; it's more of a history. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, and then and then that will cloud that. Like I still believe doing that clouds then your perception of when you watch the show or movie, because yeah. now you're not going into the show or movie clean, and you can't just judge it on its own merits. You know what I mean? All like right. you're just like, oh well, they did this differently in the book, and I don't know, guys. Anyway, question is for you: <laughs> What did you think about the black and green trailers? For House of the Dragon Season 2, are you Team Black or Team Green? Which of the two trailers did you think was better? I thought they were both fabulous. Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. 
With that down, we're now going to move on to the most important part of our show, which is hearing from you guys, getting your thoughts, theories, opinions, and all that kind of stuff. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second to thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Cabe Show podcast, our friends doing great work over at BetterHelp. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Better help. You know, guys, it's Christmas time, and I don't know about your family, but mine always used to like giving a lot of gifts. And whether you like giving big, elaborate gifts or small, personal gifts, it's important not to forget to also give to yourself during this season because the holidays are a great time to do that. So, whether it's by starting therapy, going easier on yourself during the tough moments, or treating yourself to a day of complete rest, remember to give yourself some love this holiday season, too. And you know, I think we need to talk about this more. You know, we always encourage each other when we're talking about improving our physical health, you know, going to the gym and working out. We talk about it with each other. We encourage each other. Well, I believe it's time we start doing that when it comes to our mental health. Make sure we're taking care of ourselves by looking at our mental health too. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So guys, in the season of giving, give yourself what you need with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash campia today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at BetterHelp for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with all that down and out of the way, let's get over and start taking your live comments and questions here, shall we? Jonathan, what do we got up first? First up, we've got Kevin's. Kevin's what? I don't know, but he got a $50 super chat. Thank Ooh, you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you for supporting us on that level, man. That's so generous of you. And and Kevin says, uh, hey, John and crew, that new 1943 Marvel game looks so sick. Apparently, parts of the footage they showed was actually gameplay. Uh, there's also a new uh, Black Panther solo game coming as well. Bring on the filthy. You know, somebody brought this one up yesterday, uh, the 1943, the, the Marvel game, and I hadn't seen it yet. <clears throat> But uh, mm-hmm. uh, but Ray and a couple of people said, oh, yeah, there's no gameplay footage in it. It's just like cinematic shots. But then I read yesterday that actually a bunch of the shots in the trailer are gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. And that looked like really impressive. Mm-hmm. If, if a lot of that was gameplay. Chris, did you have a chance to see this trailer? Yeah, it's killer. It's so good. They're using a, an Unreal Engine 5. Um, is how they're doing all their graphics and everything. So it's highfalutin stuff. Um, So it's going to be really great. The Rise of Hydra, it's going to be a really epic game with really fantastic storytelling, I think. I'm excited about that one. And and if that that was gameplay, I do like that there's no HUD around. It's just Mm -hmm. all cinematic. You control the guy. There's no health meter you have to monitor. There's nothing. It's just... I have out. a feeling, though, in actual gameplay, there will be a hut. Yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, because you have to, right? Like, you got to right. be able to, or maybe that gives you an option to just turn it off altogether. Did you have a chance to see this trailer, Rob? This nineteen forty three trailer? Oh my god! Yeah, I watched it like six times. <laughs> I, I, it looks incredible. Yeah, I mean, it it really looks amazing, and and you know, as the like like uh, Chris was saying, the uh, Unreal Engine. What we're going to start getting moving forward in the gaming space is going to be absolutely astonishing. You know, I've often said, John, that the art form of the 20th century was movies, was cinema. But the art form of the 21st century, I feel like games are where this the cinema was in the 20s and the 1920s. Games are there. And I don't know what the percent. revelation is going to be. But, in, but yeah, in 1927, we got sound for movies. I don't know what virtual reality, AI technology, Unreal Engine, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think by the end of the 2020s, we're going to be blown away by what we're getting, what's coming down the pike, that we don't even know what it's going to be yet, but it's going to be spectacular. Mm -hmm. All right. With that down, what's next? Kevin Irving says, uh, hi, can't be a crew. The trailer for Chucky season three, part two came out today. Looks like it looks rad. Uh, Have you been able to check it out? If so, what did you think? I don't know why I watched the trailer to this. I don't <laughs> I don't like Chucky. Like I thought the first <clears throat> I thought the first child's play was was a was a hoot. Like I I enjoyed the first child's play. I don't like anything else regarding Chucky at all. I haven't watched any of the television series, but for some reason when I saw a new a trailer for Chucky season 3 part 2, I decided to watch it. Mhm. 
eh. <laughs> I mean, but I will say this. A little old man sick Chucky looks pretty creepy. <laughs> like I have I have no I have not watched a show. I have no idea how Chucky, a plastic doll, became a very aging, sickly oh, little he plastic ages now? doll. But <laughs> it looks pretty creepy. I'll get, so, so look, I have no interest in it. I'm not gonna watch it. But as somebody with no interest and isn't watching it, it, it was a pretty creepy little trailer. I don't know. Do any of you guys watch the Chucky series? I mean, obviously, no. Chris, you make it an appointment television, right? You love your horror. Oh, my God. Every day. It's all I get. Nom, nom, nom. Horror. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate being scared. Did any of you guys see this trailer? No, not me. I did not either. But, I, I you know, Chucky has never been... I love horror and Chucky. I thought the first film was great. I think Chucky versus mm -hmm. Allison. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that I'll, I'll pay to see. All right. Right. And Chucky was fun too. What else? What do we got up here next? Jonathan? All right. Dildar, the glorious. glorious. The glorious. <laughs> Magneto. Don't make me let you. Oh, don't make me let you down, man. What an awesome scene. That is why Magneto is the boss. I want the entire season out now. It's so good. That whole, that whole time. Cause I watched with Ray. Uh, yesterday, those two episodes, and the whole time Ray's like, "This is where he's going to turn bad. This is where he's going to turn bad." And I'm like, "I don't think that's the point of this thing, man." He's like, "This yeah, is where he's going to turn yeah. bad." Yeah. I listen. I I'm, I'm going to tell you, man. I I really really enjoy. Like, look, I I'm not saying it's as good as Arcane or anything like that. Don't get me wrong, but I I thought I was very impressed. As somebody who has not been all that excited about X Men '97 at all. I got to say, I really like those first two things. And that, because I, you're right. I thought that moment that he had him up in the air, I thought this is where he's like, F Charles Xavier in his dream, right? And he said, don't make me let you down. Like, and, I, and, oh, such a good line. And you know what's a sign that it's a good show is you're excited to see the next one. That's all. Oh, hell like, yeah. There, yeah. There's no meter in like, if it's like, just that you're excited to see the next episode. I want to see the next episode already. That's That should show you how, good some people think this show is and okay now that another 24 hours has passed uh, on yesterday's show i was talking about there's an element they brought into x-men 97 that i never thought they really would and it's something that i've loved for in in x-men days of future past not x-men days of future past sorry x-men age of apocalypse rogue and magneto smash uglies and which at first seems like a really odd pair yeah. But in the comic, they explain that Magneto is able, because, you know, Rogue can't physically touch people. Oh, right, right, right. But Magneto is able to form a microscopic electromagnetic field around his skin that you can't even feel, right? And so he's able to do that so Rogue can physically touch him and smash uglies. And I, while they did that in X-Men Days or X-Men Age of Apocalypse, when they started to hint that there was a romance between Magneto and Rogue, I'm like, I never use the term ship, but I ship it. I'm all for it. I'm like, I, and it creates this really cool love triangle with Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit. And I'm like, I like, I've, I was getting far more excited for it than an adult man should. It was really Listen, cool. Listen, well, this is the all. thing with the X-Men. They are always having sex with each other. Everyone <laughs> is having sex with everybody. And it's high time that Rogue got in on that action. Okay? Oh, yeah, she needs it. I would be remiss if I don't point so out hot. that the relationship between Rogue and Magneto began actually in the comics. In uh, in X Men two seventy four, when they were in the Savage Land, Magneto was trying to be a good guy. Oh, so you even know, prior and, to Age of Apocalypse. Oh yeah, in, in oh, the I actual didn't realize that. in the main yeah the main continuity they were they were an item as well. And by the way, it was drawn by Jim Lee. You know, the Jim Lee era of, of X-Men was a spectacular era of X-Men. And when you mm -hmm. see, if you look up X-Men 2, it's, I think it's 274. If you look it up, the cover image is hot. hot. Okay, he didn't have to whisper that. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, you think those Trojan Thins are good, huh? Try I'm just, I'm just saying it's hot God. from a Jim, you know, I'm talking about Jim Lee's oh, art. Jim Lee's Try art. Try Magneto... <laughs> Nano electromagnetic field condoms. All right. What do we got up next? Kids wrap it. <laughs> don't don't rely on magnetism. Magnamito. Don't believe magnetism will save you. Magnamito. 
I feel a certain magnetism. This is how uh, con babies happen. <laughs> con babies. <laughs> <laughs> wow ah okay what do we got james germain says <laughs> invincible season two part two is at a great start i i hope so and, and i am going to check it out i just haven't rushed to start watching season two part two because season two part one was okay it was okay mm -hmm. it had it had this moments uh, but it was not nearly as good as season one. So I've lost a little of my enthusiasm, but I'm hearing good things about part two of, of the second season. So I will get onto that pretty quick. All right, what do we got next? Next up, we got Christopher Brickner. He says, I get why Kennedy is still at Lucasfilm. She uh, wants to fix Star Wars before she leaves, but she still makes the same mistakes she did over a decade ago. Why should we think her leadership will work now? I don't. I don't now, but I, I do also think this. She has it in her. Look, we've the Mandalorian came under her. Rogue One came under her. A Andor came from under her leadership. Um, she is capable of having the odd thing come out that can be really good. But I do not believe the overall direction of Lucasfilm will be solved until she moves on. Um, and, and again, I am not a Kathleen Kennedy hater at all. Uh, I believe Kathleen Kennedy is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, as Steven Spielberg, the greatest filmmaker of all time, has called her the greatest producer ever to work in the business, I think she's a marvelous producer. Her resume as a producer, better than anybody else's resume you can put up against hers. Yeah. But being a pure producer is different than being the head executive of a company. They're two different jobs. And... While George Lucas personally handpicked selected her, and while I thought on paper she was a fabulous pick at first, it has proven not to be a good marriage. Like Kathleen Kennedy and the running of Lucasfilm has proven not to be a good marriage. So while I believe any upcoming Star Wars project could be good, I do not believe the overall direction of the good ship Star Wars will be righted until she moves on. And uh, that's just kind of how I feel about it. All right. What's next? Okay. Raph from State Farm says, me seeing the House of the Dragon trailers. Oh, my God. It's happening. Oh, yeah. 100% full force. It it just, it looks, I mean, like, I still remember, Chris, like, not, it, it feels like not that long ago that we had to do the story where the showrunner said, oh, yeah, it's not coming anytime soon. Yeah. And, it's and not everyone was like, what? And, how and, can you and, not do this right now? And now here we are. It's it's a year and a half later, and it's like, ah, we might actually be here. Well, I remember when we reported on it, too. It was, guys, this is how long it takes to make a show, typically. Like, especially one that does have this kind of expensive feel to it, that does have these big mm -hmm. post-production things, that do have these really amazing tight scripts. But I think in part because of the strike, because obviously with them filming over in London and everything in the UK and Europe, not having to adhere to SAG rules, it feels like it happened so quickly because there was nothing for so long. <laughs> it's the only <laughs> silver lining. It just sped up time for me. All right. What's next? We got uh, Spooky Castle Productions. Kevin Smith is doing a third Jay and Bob uh, film. Thoughts? Yeah. I, I, I... <sighs> well, I like the last Clerks. Look, that's all Clerks I know. 3 yeah. was really good. Clerks 3 was really good. But Jay and Silent Bob and um, I, I just think it's time for him to move on from that stuff. Like I yeah. just went guys to Ann and I went to go watch. We sat front row and watched an evening with Kevin Smith that he did uh, up in these parts. And it was a wonderful evening. He did like two hours of telling stories and all. And it was amazing. He's one of my favorite guys in the business, but I really would love to see him just move on from his legacy stuff. Uh, again, I'm glad he did Clerks 3. It, it turned out real nice. Clerks 3 turned out really nice. But the Jay and Silent Bob stuff, the Mallrats stuff, like, uh, hell, I, I don't even want him to do a Chasing Amy 2. Uh, and, and there has been talk about doing a Chasing Amy 2. I don't even want to do that. I would like to see him get back and flexing some of his creative muscles and, and do some more original. Like, I know he did Red State and I know he did Tusk and that kind of stuff, but I, I would like to see him continue to explore more original stuff. 
I don't know. Am I wrong in that? Or is this all he has left is doing this legacy stuff? I agree with you, John. I mean, I think that, that, you know, one of the things about chasing Amy, the time it came out, it had a lot to say for that generation. I mean, Kevin Smith has a definitely a generational voice and now he's a father. He's faced his own mortality. You know, his, his world has changed. I mean, he's had success in the film business on many different levels. I would love to see him make a movie about his contemporaries today. You know, what, what take that Kevin Smith way of observing the world and create a new set of characters that have something to say to us now. Not that I don't want to see his, his characters that he's already created, but it's kind of a been there, done that thing. I'd love to see him. You know, what was the Mary was the Seth Rogen movie about making a porno? Seth and Mary, Zach and Mary oh, make porno. a porno. Zach, yeah. Zach, yeah. And Mary. <laughs> Zach and Mary make a porno. Sorry. Zach and Mary make, make a porno. porno. I mean, yeah. I like that movie. It was funny, you know, and, and I, I'm not saying I need to see more of that either, but it would be interesting to see because reading his journey and, and what he went through after he had a heart attack was always very interesting. And how do you take those life lessons and combine them into a story? <laughs> Ray is so that... engaged right now. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I was just He's just listening. I was just listening and then looking at a. All right, a all right, dude. Water. I'm sorry. I didn't no, mean to put you No, sleep, no, 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 no. Don't think that. I, I, I was listening to you. It's because your voice is so soothing. <laughs> right. Good and I can't. I can't see you guys on my screen. Like, I just see my uh, Premiere Pro open. So uh, all I could do is listen, and that's why I get into this listening pose. I'm sorry. It's all right. Okay, it's buddy. all right. All right. What's next? <laughs> We've got Chubbs GPT who says Netflix is the gentleman is so good. Have you seen it yet? Oh, it's so good. Yeah, it's great. I I finished it. <laughs> there goes Ray. <laughs> I love the movie The Gentleman. I love the movie. Uh, and so I am anxious to see, but I have not had a chance to watch the series yet. But I've heard good things. So, Chris, you have watched it? Yes, it is excellent. And I, Theo James is somebody who we have left off of the potential Bond list. And he oh. would be great. He's incredible. He he has such a beautiful voice. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's and he was fabulous. great in this show. He's so good in this. And uh, we talked about this a little bit. Vinny Jones. Vinny surprised the hell out of me in this so show. Good. He's phenomenal in this. I highly recommend it. I don't think enough people are talking about it, honestly. All right. Yeah, it was great. What's next? CR says, when can WB uh, move? When can WB movie wins be attributed to Zaslav and his team? Most, if not all of their recent success was in development with the previous leadership. You know, I, <clears throat> I always mention that when a big leadership thing at the top happens, it's going to take years, minimum year and a half, maximum three but it's going to take years to really feel the effect like i remember when james gunn took over dc and like shazam 2 flopped and flash flopped like ah james you know james gunn is already failing well those weren't none of those were made under james gunn's administration we're not going to see any results of james gunn's thing until 2025 when superman uh at the time superman legacy now just called superman uh comes out i think we're probably getting close to when we're going to see that because remember a lot of the stuff that we see David Zaslav doing was trying to set the table, right? Like having meetings with Christopher Nolan, having meetings with Tom Cruise, uh, making cuts, taking away, like trying to put Warner brothers in a better financial position, put them in a position where they could go from being a seller to being a buyer, like all that kind of stuff. Now, we're going to be getting in the next year or so to the point where we're actually going to start seeing, and I think most predominantly, is Superman. Like, we're going to really start seeing the effects, the creative effects uh, of of what he's been doing there. Because, guys, like, up until now, all it's been has been the behind-the-scenes setting the table. Who do we sign? They obviously signed that big deal with Tom Cruise. Who, like, what projects do we take away to, to limit our financial liabilities? What, like, all that kind of stuff. But that's not the sexy stuff that people are waiting for. We're waiting to see the on-screen stuff. And I, it looks like within the next year, I don't think Superman's going to be the first thing, but Superman's going to be, like, the first main thing that comes across. Like, it's going to be, we're going to see the results of his hiring. He hired James Gunn and Peter Safran. He gave them a mandate for what he wanted a new DC to be. And 2025 is when we're going to see that. Can you guys think of anything else coming up that is that might be kind of considered the first 
you know, is on it, screen representation of a David oh. Zaslav administration? Well, I know Creature Commandos is one of the things that's supposed to come out right. sooner than but later. But also a, the, a DC the, thing. kind of stuff. Uh, the um, Penguin, right? The Penguin or was, DC. Been... Oh, that was that greenlit under, it was greenlit like, under David Zaslav, wasn't it? I feel it? like, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Okay, so that there's that. I mean, so we got we got a few things coming here. It's going to be interesting to see because right now all we've been commenting on is the behind the scenes table setting stuff. But now we're 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 coming up pretty soon to actually seeing the on screen results of their leadership, and you know, <laughs> then we'll see if that works out well and, or not. Then any green light of the Harry Potter series too? Yeah, but again, we're ages away from that coming. Yeah, out. yeah that's that, all. Yeah. That's all just table setting until I it comes out. Just keep going back to the House of the Dragon thing. If that's on Max, that thing's going to look incredible too. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we got next? Okay, Diggy Slick says Cosmo Jarvis for Wolverine. Great build. He's got the voice and the aggression, and he's pretty much unknown, so he's cheap. I know he could pull it <laughs> off. Oh, well, I, I don't think you're wrong. I, I just like, yeah, I when, don't hate that. No, it's just that whenever somebody, whether it's a director or a writer or an actor that gets hot for a moment, all the fan casting goes around them. Uh, I mean, so look I, again, X actor, X role, all that matters is they put a great actor in the spot. But if they were to announce tomorrow that Cosmo Jarvis, uh, John Blackthorne was going to be oh, the new okay, Wolverine. That's, that's who that is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Then uh, yeah, I'd be down with it. I I think that would be decent. I think there are ten or twenty other picks that might be even better. But if they did pick him, I'd be all for it, hundred percent. All right, what do we got up next? Jay Loco says last night saw Roadhouse, uh, nineteen eighty nine, for the first time, and it was bad. So good. Hey, I'd visit the Double Deuce uh, once or twice just for table dances. LOL. Uh, ready deuce. for the new movie. <laughs> Double Deuce. And wait a minute, uh, did they, is that what it was did, they did, did I hear that they dropped the new one today? Ooh. Did Roadhouse Ray double check that? Yes. But I, yeah, it did. I live on internet right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. I I so the new Roadhouse came out today. So I think a little bit like after Ray and I go see Ghostbusters today, uh, which I know Ray is about the new oh, Ghostbusters oh, Frozen Empire. Oh, so excited. That's yeah. all he's talked about all day. Mm -hmm. Um I think I'm going to go home and watch me some Roadhouse. Uh, I and I got to see how this turns watch out. Me some road. <laughs> okay. And see, uh, I, I like I've just been dying to see Conor McGregor go, "Hey, no, fellas!" Like I can't wait to see him say that um, <laughs> in his are. brilliant acting voice. <laughs> you are on your impressions today. Uh, but you know what? I'm actually hearing some okay things about it so far. It's on. It's it, it is out. It's it is streaming. out. Prime can you video. check? Can you check the Rotten Tomatoes Ooh, okay. uh, score on that right now? All right, let's see. All right, all right. It's going a little slow for me right here. Hold on, it is sixty-eight percent. All right, That's so better it's than not, expected. So it's fresh, technically. It's not terrible. All right, what's next? Yep. All right, there's um, ninety-one reviews on that too. So that's a good chunk. Ninety-one reviews, sixty-seven percent. Oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good, good actually. Uh, Dr. Stinky says, just wanted to say love y'all. Oh, thank you, Dr. Stinky. Appreciate that, man. And then Sean and, Aww. <laughs> and then Sean in 3D <laughs> says, did you see Mr. and Mrs. Smith? I love season one. Uh, yeah, we've talked about it. Um, I thought it was pretty good. It's definitely not Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Like they really should have called it something else. Cause it is absolutely nothing like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Like, <laughs> If you're going to do like a, a reimagining, re make it just like the original, but it's got to be something like the original. And really, this is more of a what if season of Atlanta than it is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, because it is the story is completely different. The tone is completely different. Uh, the objectives of it are completely different. like it's, it's this has nothing to do with Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the movie. Um, so they really should have called something else. And I thought it was okay. I thought, I thought it was okay. All right. Uh, what's next? Sean in 3d is back and said, uh, I heard little Nikki is getting a sequel for why <laughs> I have not Ooh, heard that. And I would also, for why indeed. I would also ask for why, if that's actually true. <laughs> All right. What's next? What's rent? Uh, <laughs> Raymond Verada says variety reported of a spider verse animated YouTube short. From Sony and the Kevin uh, Love Fund to focus on mental health awareness. 
Um, if so, that's, I haven't read that story, but I mean, obviously that sounds great. So I'll definitely want to check that out if that's true. All right. What's next? Okay. Uh, crazy description says, so John team black or team green. Oh, clearly team black for me. hundred percent team black. I got no problem with anybody who's team green, but I'm a team black guy. All right. What's next? All right. Uh, Mr. I says an adaptation doesn't have to follow the original material to be good. Look at Lord of the Rings, for example. With that said, I really enjoyed Halo Season 2 and hope that Season <gasps> 3 gets made. Uh, in comes the flood. I forgot. Oh, wait, <gasps> wait, wait, wait. It's when so did that, the new episode like, what come just out? Happened? Today. Oh, the new episode's out today? Oh, no. Did he just spoil it? Shoot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's today. Oh, okay, I so, completely forgot. Okay, so we'll go. <laughs> what's happening? We'll I'm go sorry. See, I just got excited. Go, and then we'll go back to my place, order some food, and have you been Dynamic. have you been drinking? <laughs> That's what I went to the restroom for. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're gonna watch we're gonna watch Ghostbusters. I might as well make it a better movie in my head. All right, all right, let's go. All right, Matt Corey says, "Is it normal to pay a fee to be an extra in movie? A movie? Uh, I signed up for an to be an extra, uh, but on a Zoom call." Only to get a sales pitch from a casting agency. Then you did not sign up to be on a, a movie. Then, well, I mean, look. Nope. No, you. No, didn't. my friend. Um, yeah, no. Uh, it's no, no. I'm sorry. Normally, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. you can't sign up with an extra agency. Like I know, I uh, they put me on with an agency that specifically just hooked me up with being extras in in movies, and they took a small something out of it when when i would go and be an extra on something but i never had to pay anybody anything like chris is that normal audio in case people listening to the in case people listening to the podcast no. if an agent <laughs> wants money from you yeah <laughs> if if an agent or a casting agency says we need you to pay us money that is a scam. That is a red flag. The only money you will ever give an agent or manager is the 10% or 20% of your non-union from the job that you booked. Right. right. And that should be the, otherwise you're probably getting fleeced. All right. What's next? Uh, let's see. Absolutely. We've got. <laughs> getting double deuced. Ch uh, Chubb says, I uh, haven't done drugs or weed, but I'm curious about the experience. Is there a movie that best describes or depicts the experience or will I ever know until I try? Oh, no. Uh, I have uh, honestly no facility. I've never done drugs of any kind. So, so Chris? I mean, Fear and Loathing is a great example for like harder stuff. I was going to say, talk to Rob. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> and then, Rob uh, had thoughts. <laughs> okay. There... Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Well, in terms of, there's a movie directed by Gaspar Noe called Enter the Void. And first of all, it's an incredible film. It's one of the only movies in my life that I watch. It's like three hours long, but the beginning has like a 20 minute drug trip. Um, and when it, he does, I think DMT in the movie and it, 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 it works. You just, just watch enter the void. Don't read anything about it, but, but just sit down with the mindset that you're going to be seeing something you haven't seen before and watch it. It's the only movie I've watched in a long time where I watched it once and then rewound it and watched it again immediately i didn't rewind it was a disc so, <laughs> all right I'm just what's, saying what's i won't next? you mind but find it it's worth doing enter the void <laughs> all right uh we got uh so, uh softwat newman says D did you know iron man one is on the list of movies paid for by the pentagon i don't know i i don't else. think the pentagon paid for the movie yeah i mean the, uh they might have put up like some some promotional money in it or they something. They made a but... deal. And What's Marvel that? Marvel had a deal for certain movies that they made in cooperation with the, the Marvel had a deal they made with the Pentagon to team up with them so they could get materials, military materials, but some of the Marvel movies the Pentagon wouldn't they wouldn't team up with. Right, but but and they I don't didn't know the, finance the movies, up, right? Up, like they never actually finance the movies themselves. No. All right, let's get through the last couple of uh, super chats we got here, Jonathan. What we got up next? All uh, right, we got uh, Kyler Hodak who says recently watched <clears throat> Spielberg's Munich for the first time. Extremely relevant to modern events. It, it is. It is a truism in life that history really is a wheel, and it all comes back around. Um, and we are like. 
And, you know, there's that great saying that says those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And it's frightening how true that is. Like when you let your guard down as a society on certain things, certain horrors of our past start to revisit. And you're right. Um, Munich is... I remember seeing Munich again a, a bunch of years ago. I think I was still at um, Complex. Right, what's next? All right. We've got uh, Zachary gives us a, a sticker here. It says, keep it up. Oh, the thank you so guy. much. Uh, and then Softbot says, okay, paid for was overzealous, produced with, he meant. Okay, yeah. So there there was yeah. a part, like Rob was saying, there was a, they partnered up a little bit with that. So that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what's uh, next? Uh, Seth Castro says, game day, new House of Dragon trailers. Wanted to ask, which side are you on, team green or black? Me personally, I'm stuck in the middle. Love both. Yeah, oh, no. we, we kind of made that. I think all of us are more or less team uh, team black. We're all, I mean, Ray is particularly. Yeah. Well, Ray's not even team black. Ray is team Matt Smith. Yeah. that, that That's right. Ray is more team <laughs> yeah, Matt yeah. Smith. Than the, think, yeah. Dame, whenever whenever he sees Matt Smith, all, Ray literally says the words, my prince. That, that's yeah. all he ever says. So that makes it pretty clear. So kill right. him then. Just kill him. Just kill him. Oh, I didn't kill him. Get I know you guys way. are going to do it. All right. What's next? Seth Castro says game. Oh, no. Sorry. I just read that. Ray loves trench coats, says. Uh, I think every time John talks about Shogun, <laughs> we need a cleanup on aisle nine. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. Oh, Shogun. Oh. oh. <laughs> So there's good. just a bucket. There's yeah. a bucket. I think Jonathan has to throw it <laughs> out. Hey, just... Don't include me on this. <laughs> what do you? This is it's you. Like, you know? It's just it, there's there's few things as satisfying. I think Rob has said this once or twice. There's few things as satisfying a, as an entertainment fan than having ridiculously high hopes and expectations for something, and then it comes along and delivers. And that's what Shogun is for me. It's, We're going to experience like, the complete opposite with Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never had high expectations <laughs> for know. Ghostbusters. Uh, but but yeah, there's few things as satisfying as that. And Jonathan, is that it for the Super Chats? Uh, that's it for Supers. All right, guys. Well, in that case, we're having some streaming issues. So we're just going to uh, cut it off at that for today. And that'll do it. For today's installment of the John Campion Show podcast, thank you so much for being here, making the show part of your day. Big special thank you to all of you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. And number two, you supported our channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. Uh, don't forget to come on back and join us for tomorrow's episode of the John Campus Show. I want to thank the people in the room with me, starting with the guy who's going to go see Ghostbusters with me, Ray Aura. Ray, thanks for being Team here. Team Black, baby. Team Jonathan Black. Jonathan Voico. All right, see you guys later. The wonderful Chris Carr. Bye, y'all. One writer, writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Three-body problem, baby. Go get it. And uh, my name, of course, is John Campia. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.